Hi, thanks for listening to today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. In our Limitless series, today's message is about taking an assessment, and it's based on Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 9 through 18. The Life Notes are available for download from calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. I'm going to invite you to take a seat uh, to grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Nehemiah chapter 2. Nehemiah 2 is our text today. And uh, if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 469 if you're here at Sweetwater. If you're at our Parker campus, then uh, there's Bibles at the table right in the back of the room. You just get up right now. Nobody's nobody's watching. That's not true, but they'll watch you. But you can go ahead and get up, grab one of those Bibles, turn to page 469. You'll be able to follow along with us as well. Uh, And if you're joining us from home, I can't really help you with the Bible right this moment. But if you need one or want one, ask for it and we'll get you one. Uh, If you're in any of our campuses, we would love for you to take one of the Bibles that are there. If you need a Bible and want a Bible and want to read a Bible, we would be happy to uh, just give you one of those. It's our gift to you because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, can I just uh, uh, do a little self-promotion for a moment? Pastor Robert told you uh, about the Next Steps classes. If you're in Parker, uh, you have different Next Steps classes, so I apologize for that. But, uh, you know, Next Step classes are tomorrow, and we want you to be a part of those. If you've never taken them, please sign up. Please come. Uh, Whether you sign up or not, just come, okay? We've got some extra books. Uh, And uh, and I'm teaching the lead class, 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon. Would love for you to participate in that. If you want to go do the deep dive on Calvary, know why we do what we do, and, and possibly lead one day at, uh, at our church. So any of our campuses. And even if you want to drive up from Parker and join us at 3 o'clock tomorrow, I am perfectly fine with that. We've got extra books, and we'd love to have you. We're meeting in room 5 at our Sweetwater campus. Hey, have you ever uh, thought about it and realized that all your life you're being assessed? Somebody is evaluating you. Somebody is judging you. Every moment of your life, it seems like there's somebody who's looking at your life, trying to figure out who you are, what you're up to, what you're doing. It starts in school. Remember, you go to school, you get evaluated by A, B, C, D, and F. I never did understand as a child what they had against E. Right? Anybody with me on that one? It just, it didn't make any sense to me, but you're evaluated and some, they, have, they label you uh, by a, a letter grade, how you did on your work, how you, whether you answered the questions right. Uh, and then, it, you know, you, you graduate and you get a job, right? That, that's evaluation. You sit down for a job interview and there are people who are evaluating you whether or not you're good enough for this job, even if it's a lousy job, Right? And then you get, you know, evaluated for a raise and you get evaluated for promotion. Everything is assessing whether or not you're good or not. It doesn't stop there. When you're driving, there are people assessing your driving. And I'm not even talking about the people who are, uh, you know, giving you the one-way sign or anything like that. I'm talking about like the law enforcement, you know, because they're around and they're assessing whether or not you're a legal driver and you're driving legally. And then the insurance companies are assessing whether or not you're a safe driver uh, by how many tickets uh, you get and how many accidents you're in. Uh, Your life insurance company assesses your health and your habits and deciding whether or not they're gonna insure you and and they're guessing, evaluating how long you're gonna live and whether it's gonna cost them. Uh, But the ultimate arena of being judged, you guys know what it is? It's relationships, right? relationships, because people are always going, yeah, good enough, not good enough, cute enough, not cute enough, attractive, appealing. You know, I don't know what standards there are, but, you know, somebody is using different ones. So, so I failed Merelda's assessment three years in a row. <laughs> I'm just telling you, we, we, st- I, uh, we met when she was 13, I was 14, and uh, no, I, I didn't pass the, the test uh, at all for a while. I had to grow up and grow out of some of my nerdiness to, to get, uh, you know, get her to pay attention. So, uh, you know, just in, in relationships, you're always, you're always assessing, you know, is this the one, is it not? Which is why you should probably not mix alcohol with your romantic adventures. It kind of skews your judgment, and some of you can probably testify to that. 
So today we're continuing our Limitless series. We're looking at the life of Nehemiah and his burden to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem. And uh, in chapter one, if you are joining us late or don't remember, chapter one saw Nehemiah's brokenness for his people and he engaged in prayer and fasting. And we challenged you to bring your burden to God to join with us in fasting and praying and, and saying, God, uh, we really want you to answer this prayer. Uh, and the first half of chapter two saw Nehemiah's willingness to risk for success. You know, he had a, a position that put him close to the king. He was privileged, he was uh, wealthy, he was comfortable, and he put all of that at risk, including his own life, to ask the king uh, for favor. And the king said yes, and, and Nehemiah uh, received, you know, permission to go, protection to go, and provision to rebuild the walls. So today, what we're looking at is we get to see Nehemiah assess the situation. We're picking up in chapter 2, verse 9, and Nehemiah says, Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river, and I gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, by the way, those are the bad guys if you read the book, uh, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, and I and a few men with me, and I told no one what God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate, to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. And then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. Then I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. Then I said to them, you see the trouble we're in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also of the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthen their hands for the good work. Nehemiah inspected the wall. That's what he did. Before he did anything else, even though he had a burden to rebuild the wall, even though he had the permission and the protection and the plans and the provisions, he did not tell them what he was doing. He wasn't loud about the inspection. He got up in the night. He didn't want opposition. He didn't want people saying, no, you can't do it. He wanted to find out for himself what the situation was. He did that, and then we see that he was honest, okay? He did an honest assessment. I love verse 17, the first half he said, I said to them, you see the trouble we're in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. He didn't sugarcoat it. He didn't try to, you know, oh, make it sound better than it was. He's like, this is bad. This is terrible. He didn't make excuses. He also didn't blame them, even though, I just want to point this out. The walls of Jerusalem had been laying there broken down for 140 years. 140 years. Hey, you know, he's not even going, hey, why didn't you guys do something about this? He just said, this is the reality of where we are, and it's desperate. And then he challenged the people to rebuild the wall. The second half of that verse, after he tells them how bad it is, he says, come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision. Let's do something to change the circumstances, to, to alter our reality, to make it better for everyone who lives here and for the future generations. That's what he was challenging them to do. Because Nehemiah knows he can't lead, or he can't lead, he can lead the project, but he can't do all the work by himself. And so he issued the challenge and the people responded. And we'll talk more about that next week. But Nehemiah assessed his situation. Now let's talk about Calvary's situation. Uh, we're in a building program. 
And, and if that's news to you, then uh, uh, either I haven't been communicating clearly or uh, you're just joining us. But we're in, a, we're in a building program. That's what this Limitless campaign is all about. And, and the reason is because we are committed to the mission of life change. Look, that's why Calvary exists, to lead people to a life-changing relationship of Jesus. And everything we do is connected to the mission of life change. I mean, that's why we do the things we do. That's why last year we averaged 1,787 people in person attendance. That's why we averaged 1,383 people online every single week, either watching us live, some of you are doing that right now, or tuning in later and watching us uh, on, their, uh, on demand. And so over 3,000 people a week were participating in Calvary's worship every week last year. That's kind of cool. And then that's why we baptized 228 people in 2023. So 200, and we just, you know, you're seeing more. But in the last five years, we baptized over 1,000 people as a church, as a ministry. Uh, And then uh, it's why we have over 1,200 adults involved in life groups. Are you guys pro-life groups? Anybody excited about them? See, those of you who aren't in them are like, I don't know. Everybody else, they're, they're kind of passive about it too. But anyway, I thought they'd be louder. And it's why Celebrate Recovery is averaging over 150 a week. All right, why do 150 people make more noise than 1,200? I don't get that. Uh, level of excitement. Anyway, uh, look, Calvary is succeeding in the ministry of life change. Praise God. But since we're being honest, talking about assessing our situation, we are running out of space. Okay, we're running out of space. We're running out of space for worship at Sweetwater. By the way, we're running out of space for worship at Parker. And, and those of you in Parker right now, you're like, we don't, we, we still got room. Yeah, but as soon as you get into your new building, hopefully soon, you're gonna need to go to two services the very first week. It's gonna be awesome because God's doing a work there. And I want you guys to be excited about that. I can't hear you yet. So uh, I know it's 35 miles, but you can, I wanna hear you. Um, look, if you attend... Uh, you know, 930 service here at Sweetwater, you know there's no room. There hasn't been a room for a year at 930. But uh, I don't know if you look around here on Saturday night or 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, then uh, it's, you know, comfortably crowded already. Still, you can find places to sit, but it's still, it's comfortably crowded. And, uh, and some of you are 930 refugees, right? Yeah. <laughs> You guys are like, all right, Pastor Chad's asking us to move. We'll go to the lame Saturday night service. Uh, so I'm glad you're here. Uh, but, uh, but here's the thing. If we reach 1,000 more people or more in the next five years, where are we going to put them? See, where are we going to put them? And, and by the way, just in case you're wondering, we've tried overflow services. Uh, look, it costs a lot in personnel expenses, and they didn't really succeed. Uh, we could add more services to this campus, you know, but that costs money for staff and it requires doing video uh, sermons for, a, you know, a lot more of our campuses and there's not a lot of excitement uh, for that in town. Uh, so the most cost-effective way to add space is to add a mezzanine here at Sweetwater Campus, okay? Now, it's gonna take our capacity from about 720 to over 1,000, and it's going to allow us to run about 3,000 people in-person attendance uh, before we're full again, which means that we have room to grow by about 50% if we do this project. So, uh, and, and by the way, in case you're wondering, we're doing this project on a cash basis. Uh, we're, we're not going to incur any new debt. Uh, we want to build at the speed that God provides, which is why we're inviting you to come to the dinners. And, and look, uh, Pastor Robert already shared, they're filling up. Uh, about 70% full already. And if you haven't signed up, you can sign up online, calvaryaz.com. Uh, you, in your bulletin, you can like use your phone and go on the QR code right there and that'll take you to the sign up. But if you're analog, in other words, if you're not really good uh, signing up on things online, turn this thing over. You can fill it out with a pen and drop it in the offering box and we will sign you up and we will not judge you for being lazy. We will just assess that maybe you're a little bit older like some of us dinosaurs are. Uh, Is that fair enough? So uh, look, we just want you to come. 
If you believe in the mission of life change and you believe in supporting that, we want you to come to one of the dinners and hear about what we're gonna be doing uh, with the, the mezzanine and with the other buildings and things like that, paying off our debt in Parker. Uh, all of those things are part of this Limitless campaign. And we want those of you who are interested, we want you to be a part. So we assess. Uh, that's Calvary's situation. We're trying to be honest about it. That's where we are. Now, the question I wanna ask you, is will you assess your life? Now, this is kind of hard for us to do. And it's hard for all of us to do because it means that we have to be uncomfortably honest about where we are in life. We have to kind of challenge ourselves to change because none of us like to change easily. And so uh, because I know it's difficult, I invited some friends who have walked this journey, who've walked this road to share their challenging and triumphant journey with you. And by the way, this is the cue, guys, for you to move the tables. You're late by about 35, 40 seconds. No one's noticing it at all. So, uh, <laughs> oh. hey, I think you know my friends. Uh, it's Jesse and Valerie Pruitt. And uh, uh, it is great to have you guys with us. Thank you for being willing to share your story. Uh, and, uh, and, and I know some of you know their story really well, and some of you don't have a clue what their story is. So uh, I hope this will uh, help you to appreciate where they are and the heart they have to serve out of. So uh, Jesse and, and Val, uh, God has miraculously transformed your lives, and specifically, uh, Valerie, your life. I've watched him do that. Can you just share your story and how you got here? I'd love to do that. Hi, church. So before I jump into my story, I wanted to bring up the stigma of the word addiction. So if you're currently suffering from an addiction to either substances or behaviors, I want you to know in this community we have help for you, and we do have an incredible resource here at the Sweetwater campus on Monday nights at 6.30. So, yeah. So I invite those of you who identify that you are not perfect, which is all of you, you're invited to celebrate recovery on Monday nights. So the misconception I wanted to talk about is things like drugs, alcohol, um, shopping addiction, gambling. Those things aren't the, the actual issue. It's not the root of the problem. Um, so if you don't struggle with something that you would call an addiction, I just want to encourage you to not just sit back and go, oh, I'll pray for the person. I know this person's struggling. Like really lean in because it's not about the addiction. It's about what's underneath that. It's about the sin that's underneath that. So once I removed my addiction, what was underneath was my sin, which was selfishness and family dysfunction and pride and unmitigated pain from trauma. So um, we're going to talk about the process that our family took in learning to trust Christ, and um, anyone can benefit from doing that. So to answer your question, thank you. Um, <laughs> sorry, I found um, I found myself exposed. I had been hiding a secret addiction to opiates, which led me down a destructive path, uh, where I began to lie and hide to support my drug habit. I was working as a nurse at the hospital, and when this shameful truth was um, discovered at the beginning of 2018, um, you know, I was exposed to some serious legal consequences that allowed me to face that reality that although I appeared to trust God and um, live my life to follow him, I actually was not. After my deceit and addiction were revealed, um, the first thing I did was call a fellow believer and um, he had to help me muster up the courage to go home and face Jesse and tell him my humiliating truth. Um, so something amazing happened when I did that. I was met with undeserved and unreserved grace by my husband and by my kids and my family, and my friends, and my pastors, and my church. So I made a decision to fully surrender to whatever the Lord was asking me to do. And with the direction of a therapist, um, we, Jesse and I found a dual diagnosis inpatient drug rehab facility that was able to treat both my substance abuse issues and my post, uh, my PTSD. Okay, well, uh, 
Thank you for sharing that. How long were you actually in uh, rehab uh, back in 2018? Okay, so the plan was 30 days. But when I got there, I was like, ooh, I'm jacked up. I need longer. So my husband and I, um, about a week in, we both decided together as a family that I would stay as long as it took, whether that was 30 days or a year, whatever it took. And you were there 90 days? 90 days. Okay. Uh, Jesse, what were you thinking as all of this was coming to light uh, and uh, Val was hitting rock bottom? Yeah, so I, I didn't know the full extent of where Val's addiction was. I just kept knowing that I'm supposed to pray over her. I was hearing from God to just pray over her. I really saw how much God loves us in that through the healing that's happened. I, I remember praying over her at night because I knew, again, something was off, but I didn't know the extent. Then once this came out, my heart was just to see her fully awakened as, as a new follower of Christ at the end of that. And it was really tough when it's you. That's the one, you know, our whole family, our whole life can change in just this moment. But the beautiful thing that, that happens is God, when we allow and we fully surrender to him, he does so much healing and gives us so much hope. Um, so yeah, that was what we were facing as a family. So I just wanted to, to support Val and to walk with her through that and um, with our children too. It was something that they got to learn and see in, in a healthy way of what that looks like. Okay. Hey, um, Val, you experienced... Okay. Feel, there's lots of things to applaud in the story, so uh, feel free anytime. Hey, Valerie, you experienced dramatic life change through the recovery process. Uh, can you kind of share about the process that enabled you to heal? Yes, I can. So first and foremost, complete full surrender to Christ. Because if I didn't do that first step, nothing else would have worked. It wouldn't have stuck. I watched it happen with many of my friends. So the first, first thing I did, full surrender to Christ, whatever you want me to do, I'm willing to do whatever you tell me to do. Um, then I adopted radical honesty, which sometimes my husband loves, sometimes he doesn't. I became really emotionally raw. Um, I invited accountability to like a very uncomfortable level, which was something I definitely was not used to. But the really cool thing that happened was the people around me when I started living more like that, it invited that kind of um, transparency in their lives too. And that's a really beautiful byproduct of confession. Yeah. The, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I watched you as you, uh, you know, walked that road or when you came out of that and how different you were, but what was it like being in rehab for three months? It was rough. It was, um, but it was also a process that I'm so grateful for. Um, I remember the first night there, I was just alone for the first time with my thoughts, with you know my, my normal coping skill, which was using drugs and alcohol to numb the pain, was gone. And I was left alone by myself talking to God and having to really confront the reality that I had made a complete mess of my life. I dragged my family into that. Um, and it was, it was really hard, but it was a really um, good process. And it was a process that I fully um, submitted and surrendered to. I remember being in rooms with other people who were just so broken and sharing like the most wretched parts of their lives together. And um, it sounds really painful and it was, but it was equally as freeing to be in those rooms. Um, I discovered what it was like to truly walk in freedom in Christ. I was so desperate for change and I sought comfort and truth by studying God's word. And um, our entire family walked through this together. They were a part of the process through the whole thing. Mm. So Jesse, what were you and the kids going through during that you know, time of rehab with Val? Yeah, I just want to say that I was so grateful that Val chose this path because I couldn't choose that for her. Nobody could. Because if it would have stayed the way it was going and she didn't choose that, I don't know how we were going to stay together or for her to be in the home with us, with my children. So I was so grateful for that. And then the next step was the realization of, um, you know, Val is away from us as a family. 
And I realized that this isn't a vow problem, this is a family problem. So me and the kids got uh, counseling and, and we dove into, uh, man, I was just seeking the Lord. I, I knew what dependency looked like at that moment with God. And so I was just uh, praying with my friends and family. People were inviting me over for dinners, and which was amazing that they did that. So I didn't feel like we were walking alone. We were supported by our church family and, and family and friends. And then uh, the other part was that uh, we got invited in to learn. So I was on phone calls with Fowl and their therapist, and we were learning together. And, and at one point, the therapist said, hey, I want, I want you to write an angry letter. And I was like, I'm not angry. What do you yes, mean? Yes, you are. You're angry. <laughs> and so that night I was like, okay, I'll write this letter out. And I was like, ooh, I'm angry. <laughs> so I was able to let all that out that I stuffed down. I didn't even realize at that point. And we got to talk through that together. Um, and the other awesome thing that I loved is that they invited our family there for a weekend to learn about addiction and enabling and all these things that are how it bra- changes our brain. And uh, I w- while I was in there, I remember there was a, a husband with his wife and he was like, well, I'm not gonna stop drinking. That's my wife's problem. And they were like, no, you will set her up for failure because it's still in your home, in your fridge. And if she comes home, we wanna see her succeed. And, and he hadn't got it at that moment. So it just reminded me too how much when we come together, especially with God and we, and we support each other, you know, that, that's part of it will help us carry to heal. Mm. So um, what's your life like now? Okay, six years later uh, from the, uh, just your life being completely shattered and broken and hopeless at a, at a point, what is your guy's life like now? Well, there's a lot of laughter. Yes, there is. <laughs> there's a lot of sarcasm, because that's my love language. Um, yeah, for real. Um, there was a lot of um, welcoming of tough conversations. The most incredible thing that happened was that we got to model this new way of resolving healthy conflict in front of our children. And that is probably the best life lesson that we could have taught our kids aside from loving Jesus was to, to learn how to relate to one another and to come together and to tur- turn towards Christ and towards each other instead of away from each other. Yeah, and I remember as soon as Val came home, one of the biggest things we wanted to do was to pray together and be just honest and open in that prayer. One, to encourage. So I wanted to encourage a prayer over her as she did with me. And um, also communication. I would always want to communicate and be like, no, there's got to be more. Let's go to the depths. And she's like, no. I'm running. You're right. And I'm like, I don't want just right. I want us to communicate. And I feel like that healing brought so much because you came home and we communicated so much. That transparency went to a whole nother level and that dependency on God continued. And uh, yeah, it was a joy to have like this new, fresh life as a family. And that was all because of God. Amen. So, um, Val, what would you share with people or how would you challenge people about getting honest? Because you talked about uh, assessing your life and seeing it for what it was. Uh, So what would you tell them uh, just about being honest with yourself? I love this part. Don't stay stuck. Call that counselor. Go to that meeting. Reach out to that friend, the friend who gives zero rips what anyone else thinks about them. If you don't have one of those friends, you can go to CR, and they're definitely there. Pick them up there. Um, Get to know God and his loving, merciful character. Um, He desires that intimate relationship with you. And prioritize an assessment of your life. What do you think, Jess? Yeah, I would say, you know, don't expect change if you don't take a step. So I would encourage you to take that first step. And it's really hard. It's hard to be open and transparent, but there's so much freedom when we just open up and we don't carry that poison around or the things that's really tough and we we don't want to share. Throw that shame out and live out freedom in Christ. Um, He loves you so much and he wants to see that healing with you, but it's up to us to take that step. So don't give up. There's always hope and make that first step today. So, uh, 
What have you learned, Val, that you really would love to just challenge people, share with others uh, as we wrap up this, uh, this time together? Okay, that's simply that there's no shame in exposure. There's freedom and an opportunity to see just how powerful God is um, when we submit to him. So, hey, I appreciate you guys being willing to share your story and the pain and just the way God has redeemed. His limitless power has transformed your lives, and it is a beautiful thing to see. And I'm so proud of the way you guys have come through this and the people you are today. So, you guys want to give my hand? Thank you, guys. <clears throat> So here's the final question. What will you do to partner with God in rebuilding your life? You know, you know, if you're hesitant to make an assessment of your life, then you're not going to be able to address the things that are holding you back. And, and I just want to go back to the, the people of Nehemiah's day who tolerated a terrible situation for 140 years years. And it wasn't until one person showed up who said, we don't have to live this way, that they finally took action and did something about it. Um, Val's life got to the point where she had to do something about it because she was facing uh, felonies. She was facing jail time. She was facing uh, losing her family. All of that pushed her into that corner. So she had to do something about it. And, and some of you are, are stuck. And, and God wants to move you to healing. God wants to give you an opportunity to rebuild your life. So what are you willing to do to partner with God in rebuilding your life? Um, you know, is it to get counseling? Because we told you last week, we got counselors uh, available, pastoral counselors that would love to, to meet with you, talk with you, help you. Uh, we have this ministry called Celebrate Recovery, Monday nights at 6.30 right here. And more and more people are finding healing and growth in coming to Celebrate Recovery. So we would love for you to be part of that. Uh, or, or maybe you just simply need to get honest with some people about where you are and what you're struggling with. Now, we want to help you, so we gave you some tools, okay? In your life notes, and you guys have life notes if you have a bulletin. If you're doing this online, they're in there too. There is uh, some assessment questions that we challenge you to answer honestly. Okay, take those home, do that, have a conversation with your spouse or with a friend. Uh, there's also a couple of other evaluations you can go to online. They're really easy on the YouVersion app because you can just click on it and it takes you right to them. But it's, a, it's an assessment tool for how you're doing spiritually. How's my life spiritually? Do, you know, am, I, am I seeking God and where can I grow? And, and there's one that's a marriage assessment. All of them will take you about 10 minutes. If you do all three, you're talking about a half an hour of effort to go, where am I as a person? Or you may just be sitting here going, I know where I am and I know what I need to address. Then the question becomes, will you make room for God to change your life? He's waiting for you to take that step towards him. He's already pursuing you all the way from heaven. That's why he sent Jesus into this world to be our savior. And today we're just simply asking, are you going to trust him to change your life? Let's pray. Father, we recognize that we need you. We're desperate without you. We are completely hopeless without your power in our lives. And your power is limitless. You can change us. You can free us. You can help us to overcome whatever it is we're facing. God, if we step into confession and honesty, then, then there is no shame, there is no guilt, there is simply the freedom that you give us as we get honest and as we ask for your forgiveness and healing. So God, help us to trust that, help us to, to seek that, and most of all, help us to hear your voice and, and make those choices to give you place in our life and invite you to change us. Thank you for the love that you have for us that never lets us go. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Today, Pastor Chad challenged us to assess our commitment to following Jesus and his commandments. So how are you doing? If you downloaded the Life Notes earlier and followed along, great. 
If not, can I encourage you to do so now? They're available at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. There, you'll find some questions to ponder and record your answers, plus links to two additional assessments. Take this next week to reflect on your life and learn what areas God would like you to grow in. That'll do it for today. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Are you looking for a way to dive deeper into scripture and make it a part of your daily routine? Check out Calvary's Word for the Day daily devotional videos. Visit calvaryaz.com forward slash D-E-V-O and sign up to receive these three to five minute devotionals right to your inbox each day. Our team of pastors and leaders share meaningful insights from the Bible to equip and encourage you in your faith journey. Don't miss out on this opportunity to grow in your relationship with God and connect with the community of believers. Sign up today and start receiving your daily dose of scripture.